She said, before you can buy so she can provide us so we can say anything else. <laughs> I feel like you should be the centerpiece. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> so to keep us from the desk. Right. Are you, you are the moderator. Moderator. And the moderator usually gets set a spot. Well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to, I'll go into the gallery practice. and let people know that we're going to start here. I think we should really go ahead and Finished editing this. Um, it's not a piece of paper. This, you want this story is intact, but I can finish that piece and close it out. Yeah. 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 It just kind of took out a lazy morning, very restful, and slept in. Now it's cold, so I'm not sleeping in. No, it's good though. This is so. Oh, it's drive over the town. I know. It's always. Yeah, it's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to manage is what the same people are seeing and what we are seeing. Yeah, and it's that screen share. So, I'm moving off the screen. So, no hiking this way. There we go. Okay. So now, this feels like you should have. I just had time to make And when are you sitting here? I was going to change your slides. I think Michelle's actually going to take over. But yeah. Either way, once I get this part figured out, then I'll look at you and I'll take some directions. Oh, did you get them to the board? We did. That was the only thing you did. That's got four bits on sheets. The board was one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes. About yes. some Paris Cabinets going or that you're just like, oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so whenever you want to start. Right. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and 
Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Um, we're going to go ahead and start uh, panel two for following the Manito Trail. Um, today the panel focuses on Manito migrations and mountain memories. I'm really honored to have a fabulous uh, panel here uh, with Troy Lovata, Matthew Sandoval, and Dr. Vanessa Chavez, uh, Fonseca Chavez uh, moderating. Uh, I wanted to thank the New Mexico Humanities Council for sponsoring our entire uh, humanities discussion panel series, um, and also thank the uh, Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area for sponsoring the entire exhibition. Uh, we couldn't do it without these partners. Um, so we'll go ahead and turn it over to the panel and uh, enjoy. Wonderful. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are delighted to offer you the second uh, panel in the humanities discussion series um, funded by the New Mexico Humanities Council, so we're thankful for that. Um, my name is Vanessa Fonseca Chavez. I'm originally from Grants, New Mexico, but my family did lots of in-state migrations and I experienced lots of out-of-state migrations, um, so I'm very much part of that Manito Trail as well. Um, I'm the co-director of the Following the Manito Trail project. Um, my fellow co-director is Levi Romero. He's sitting in the back of the room over there. And uh, my family roots are mostly in northwestern New Mexico, but also in California, in Kansas, and in Mexico. So I also want to recognize those routes as well. Um, I'm an associate professor of English at Arizona State University, where I also serve as the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts. Um, this is my own bio I'm giving you right now. So uh, <laughs> my research and teaching mostly focus on uh, Chicana, Chicano, and Indigenous communities, uh, primarily in the Southwest. Um, I'm the author of Colonial Legacies in Chicana and Chicano Literature, which came out with the University of Arizona Press in 2020. And then my colega Levi Romero and I, along with Spencer Herrera, co-edited the Querencia Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland book, which was published in 2020 with the University of New Mexico Press. You can see it over there in the case, and then you can read a little bit about it as you pull some of those uh, uh, pamphlets off the wall. So thank you again for joining us today uh, for our in-person and our Zoom discussion. Um, our panel today is scheduled for two hours, um, and we are honored to have some really great presenters with us this afternoon. To give you a sense of our format for today, we would like to hear first from both presenters, and then we'll follow the presentation with questions from the audience. If you are attending via Zoom, please feel free to write your questions in the chat, and our lovely Zoom facilitator, Karen, will be able to read your question aloud. For those of you that are in person, we just ask that you save your questions until the end, until both of our presenters have finished. And one more note, um, we do have a uh, feedback flyer over here at the corner of the table, and we invite you to uh, offer some feedback from the presentation today. Uh, this is feedback we're collecting for all the humanities discussions during the next few months. So without further ado, I'm going to start with our first presenter to my left, uh, Troy Lovata, who is a professor in the Honors College at the University of New Mexico with the faculty affiliation with the Southwest Hispanic Research Center. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Professor Troy Lovata's research and teaching focuses on how the past is depicted in the present and how people from prehistory to present, Mark the Landscape, and his publications include the book, Inauthentic Archaeologies, Public Uses and Abuses of the Past, and Understanding Graffiti, Multidis Multidisciplinary Studies from Prehistory to Present. The title for his presentation today is Using the Trees to Mark Mountain Trails, Using the Mountains to Define Manitos. So let us please welcome Troy Lovata. Thanks, Vanessa, and thanks for everybody coming out and via Zoom. Um, so what I want to talk about today um, is this, this idea that place and landscape and meaning and experience all come together for Manitos. And on one hand, place is connected from where you come from, but on the other hand, it's about also where you go to and to kind of think about how that process works. So um, forester Stephen McCool talks about how Aspen forests, which we have plenty of here in New Mexico and across the mountain west are special places. And they're places special because of the trees, because of their environment in the mountains, and because of how we go into them. Sometimes in the summertime, those leaves are green and quaking and it's like nothing else to hear them 
It's like a little flock of birds sometimes. Um, other times in the fall, it's fiery and vibrant. And as you move up and down the mountain, it's part of how that process works. Um, along with that though, the trees themselves are often where we leave our marks because that white bark, now it's not purely white most of the time, but that white bark is relatively clean. And it's a place that you mark and you carve and you talk about and you draw and you even sort of internalize and externalize who you are and where you're going and what things are around you. So those aspen forests, again, are across the world, but they play a pretty particular role in New Mexico and up the Rocky Mountains. And that's that first image up there. This one, I think, if I remember right, is from outside Santa Fe up in the Sangre de Cristos. Um, next slide. So when I said people mark on those trees, ah, is there? There we go. Um, I have to say that they're graffiti. There's no way around it. And for a lot of, lot of time, people thought of graffiti as something very urban and as something very, in a sense, you know, it's deviant. It's not supposed to be there. Um, and graffiti is something that, that you quickly erase because it shouldn't be up there. And over time, scholars have really thought about graffiti, and it doesn't mean that it changes the definition of something that shouldn't be there or maybe not shouldn't be there, but didn't quite get permission, but realizing that those marks, those images, those letters are a reflection of the context in which they're in. And so first off is the realization that people's idea of graffiti is something that maybe in 1970s New York or Philadelphia, and it's on a subway car, and that's where these images are from, um, is something that actually, if you dig into the scholarship, you know, it, it really is not what's happening. You look at graffiti and we realize, my background is in archaeology and anthropology, that we have graffiti from 2000 years old. We have graffiti around the world and some of it is written on walls and even ancient Roman bathroom walls occasionally. And some of it is exactly what you would expect on an ancient Roman bathroom wall. Um, <laughs> but others of it are about empowerment and about the idea that it's a place to show who you are and communicate with other people. And so, if you can kind of jump from the idea of a lot of scholars had of graffiti is something that we should quickly erase, but actually ask that question, why is it there? And why did people leave it? Um, and that leads you down some really interesting paths. So again, it's not just on subway cars, but it's, it's on plants and tree graffiti. Um, we as scholars call it arbor glyphs and it accompanies a whole amount of writing, a drawing and marking on trees in different ways. And it's not surprising that a lot of it is going to be things like hearts and people's initials. Um, and it's a powerful thing. You can go back and when I say some of the oldest graffiti, we find some of the oldest graffiti a couple thousand years old are hearts and people's initials. And this idea that it's, it's a forest of love. Um, it comes up in even to a digital world. There's a group that has a project that they would rather you not right on the trees. So they set up a digital place where you can scratch on a digital tree online. And it's not quite the same thing, but you realize that continuity. And you find it in things like Shakespeare wrote about um, Orlando writing about his love on the trees and stuff like that. So it goes back in, in even further. Um, you know, some of the Greek scholars talk about lonely shepherds writing poetry on the trees as well. And so it's something we see here in New Mexico and across the Mountain West. And we see it partly because the trees are there. It's an easy tree to write on. And those aspen trees are a great canvas. Now they're not the only canvas. And it's not just only here in this region. Um, up here on the, your left, um, this is a photo I took of not at all an aspen tree. Um, that's a palm tree from Kirshner Island in Aswan, Egypt. Um, and this is a, and my, I don't speak Arabic, but it's more or less Muhammad was here. Is what I was told. It's written up there. And, you know, it doesn't have to be an aspen tree and there certainly are no aspen trees in Egypt. Um, on the right, one of the, the scholars who's really done a lot, um, he's now retired, but really pushed this idea of trying to understand context and of trees, was um, a Basque scholar from California, Arizona, the Reno area. And he really went out this idea to understand the Basques who came to the U.S. as immigrants, primarily as sheep herders, um, and all these marks that they left across that region around sort of like Lake Tahoe up into Oregon, even into Idaho a little bit. And in a lot of ways, he really helped define a lot of that scholarship, although he's very focused just on Basques. And that's a good thing, but, you know, it, it doesn't capture everything. The other one is I think he always was a little embarrassed about it being graffiti. He wanted to be art and not graffiti. And he talked about that. And one of the things I think in the last couple of years, scholars have realized is it can be both, that it's not one or another. And it's not an embarrassment of a thing that should be erased. Um, it's, it's about understanding it in a different way. Um, now, there are Basques across places like New Mexico, and I'll talk 
a little bit about Wyoming, Colorado as well. Um, and in some ways that scholarship that, that, that Jose did was so powerful, it can sometimes overlap other people's ideas of things. Um, but there's a lot more people marking those trees. So um, here in New Mexico, um, some of the first sort of scholars to, to look at trees were folklorists. And so in 1968, 1967, 68 seems to be when he took the pictures, James DeCorn, and eventually in 70, he put out this book, Aspen Art in the New Mexico Highlands. And it was primarily, he'd found this amazing grove of trees outside El Rito. So, you know, and that basically they had, at the time, um, carvings that had dates that went back 100 years. So, you know, something in the 19, late 1960s means he found carvings that were on these trees that went back into the 1800s. Now, aspen trees don't live particularly long as trees. Um, they live longer here in the Mountain West than other places because they also grow slower. We're a little bit drier. Um, but about 100 years, 120 years is about the longest aspen tree you're going to find in the U.S. And one thing that his book ends with, and it's a it's really engaging photo essay, um, that his book ends with is in fact, the trees fall down, they get cut down. And it actually ends with a picture in 1968 of a bulldozer knocking down like 30 trees. Um, and so it's this part of this process. Now, that's another understanding of it. It's graffiti and graffiti isn't something always occasionally will end up on a gallery wall um, and even something that someone collects. Um, but other times it's meant to be at a place that does sometimes go away or change. And that's an interesting process. So um, here up on your left, this is um, from, uh, if I trying to remember correctly, this is right up north of Chama. Um, it's a little area called Buckles Lake that's just across from the Colorado border. And this area, um, tremendous number of sheep herders from New Mexico went in that area, kind of coming from all around in northern New Mexico. This one looks like it's 1905. And so this was recorded a couple of years ago, some people I was working with. And so this is a pretty old tree now. Um, and it's, you know, it'll fall down eventually. Um, it already is pretty beat up. It's not quite as beautiful. It kind of looks like alligator skin. Now, there's no good way to date aspen trees because we can't get those nice, beautiful rings that some other trees do. And we depend on people writing down the year and being accurate. Um, but we can look at some other things, like interesting ideas like handwriting changes. Any of you have looked at those 100-year-old documents? People had some different signatures than now. Um, and we can even sort of try and put that together. So when you carve on an aspen tree, what happens is if you don't need to carve deep. Occasionally, you'll see somebody who looks like they're carving with a hatchet. Um, but literally, your fingernail can cut into an aspen tree. And if you wait a year, sometimes that fingernail appears. And it's this interesting process of thinking about it. Um, and sometimes people answer each other and carve and recarve. And also sometimes, this one's a name and a date, sometimes people come back and questioning how they're coming back and why they're coming back and leaving year after year. Um, it's an interesting process. So now I said it's graffiti and sometimes we think about graffiti as fundamentally like I was here, which is a great thing. But actually graffiti can be very complicated. Um, I think I missed one. Oh yeah, you there might have, yeah, there we go. This is um, this is near San, this is in San Pedro Parks, which is outside Cuba, New Mexico, a wilderness area. Um, this is on a ridge with a trail that today is a recreational trail, hiking, backpacking. If you ever go out there in November, it's full of elk hunters. Um, but it's also overlays what used to be a tremendous sheep and cattle industry going up into this very wet area of New Mexico. Um, and these are arrows. And as you hike up the trail, you first see there's an arrow pointing left and you can see there's an arrow right and they've scratched it out. And as you go up that ridge, you, the ridge is tough, it's steep. And I and my students have gone up it and they're not always happy when I'm cracking the whip on them to like hike <laughs> uphill really steep. And it looks really good to cut off into this little, this little valley. But what you don't know is if you go a quarter mile up the valley, there's a giant rock fall and you can't get up. And so sometimes it's about marking place in a different kind of way. I mean, it is literally navigation. And we'll see some graffiti across New Mexico and Colorado and Wyoming that literally will have an arrow and say agua. And they're trying to tell each other where the springs are at. And sometimes an arrow that says beware. And they're trying to tell someone not to go there. I mean, that Buckles Lake area, there was an interesting, very poetic little four line, almost haiku that in Spanish basically said, your wagon cannot make it, please turn back. <laughs> yeah, and we walked up there and yes, wagon cannot make it. <laughs> but most of it really does come down to this idea of I was here. And so this is also near San Pedro Parks, which isn't too far from Coyote, New Mexico. And this with the double L spelling is Coyote. And it's old enough, it's where the trees are at, we're, we're pretty sure it's a probably, 1940s to 1960s sheep or cattle herder is up here. It's a really beautiful location on the top of a ridge. You can almost see back below. It looks down into a really lush, small valley. 
and it's not surprising that someone says that thing in graffiti of this this is where I was this is who I am um you know the other thing that we see often then is um it's not something that goes away um it's something that's still done and if you talk to the you know the forest service today they're not always happy that people are carving trees um and yeah it is damage and when I said it's graffiti it is you know your definition can go back and forth of allowed or even you're truly not not allowed but sometimes not permission um and so like on the left there this handprint with the curl this is probably a one or two year old print um and a lot of early research like i said like decorns was folklorists they were looking at a lot of things like sheep herders but the realization is people are and were in the in the forest for a lot of other reasons and even if you were a sheep herder you were in the forest for a lot of other reasons and i wouldn't be surprised that this other one which is near santa barbara creek in taos county here um that it's probably a, a hunter and went up there and you know while they were on their spare time maybe in the middle of the day when it was getting a little warm and all the animals were hiding bedding down a little bit they made a beautiful carving um and so one of the things we see is this back and forth of reusing places and there's a real role in that you can be someone who's out there herding sheep but sheep herding isn't what it once was you know in the before the taylor grazing act in the you know 1930s or so sheep herding was the king of new mexico um you look at some of the numbers and things like you know rio reba and taos county alone it was 1905 or something had four million sheep two counties and you know to think about that process now what happened is we're a global environment and even back then new mexico was um <laughs> things changed cattle became a little bit more of a king um things like australia and new zealand especially post-world war ii became the place you went for wool and mutton and all those other things um today we still have we still have sheep here but we don't have those numbers anymore we have different things going on and but the people are still going to the forest and they're still carving things and they're still showing about their presence next one So when I said it's about being there, and if you're in New Mexico, you know about descansos. I mean, you can't go down the road without seeing them and understanding why they're there. Um, up here on, on your right, this is a uh, descanso up in the Sangre de Cristos, and I don't know the whole story because it's just got some initials, um, but it's a descanso on a tree. And this one is actually, I just took this a couple weeks ago and added on to it from, I've been watching it for a couple years. Someone's now put this little cup on a little like you know hanging there on the tree and i wouldn't be surprised if they're having a little memorial shot you know next to what happened um there's got to be a reason that pickup is there if it was the car accident was the idea or it was the beloved thing and again when people leave their initials or their name it's about that process and sometimes we can think about it as you're leaving your own name but then this carving which is also nearby in the sangre is, is in memory of cg or cfg and we can't quite make out the date anymore um, it's gotten a little too scarred underneath. And this is purely a disconso in that same way we can think about something roadside. In the forest, you remembered someone there. And I don't know the story. You know, was it the place that they met their demise or was it the place that they most liked to be? And there's there's something in that process. Occasionally, I see this one on the left that I've wandered up there. It's not too hard to get to. Um, kind of hoping that on a random weekend, I'll find somebody up there. You know, I can get the story. I haven't tacked a note on the tree yet to see if they'll tell me. But it might happen. So, you know, it's about identity and it's about place. Um, this is near Buckles Lake as well. And this is that New Mexico ZSM. And it's about saying, this is who you are. And, you know, it's an operating in the process as well. And so when we think about that process and we think about it, it's about going out into the forest and you think about what you're doing there and where you're coming from and why you're there. And it can go back and forth in some interesting ways, but it's about being in place. So one thing is a lot of these we find in a lot of people who are Minitos, whether they're in New Mexico or they went somewhere else to work, you know, from that mid 1800s through about the mid 20th century, they were working on sheep and they were going in there to be laborers in those sort of ways. Sometimes they were herding them, sometimes they were shearing sheep. There's a whole range of reasons. And it's not surprising that a lot of the carvings, you could call them the lonely sheep herders. Um, a lot of them are about we're men in the forest without women. Um, and so these are, I guess, the more women's heads, let's put it that way. Um, and these three are all from um, the Sierra Madres in Wyoming. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. There's a lot of them that are naked women and poetry about the women that have wronged them or that they hope to get back home to and things like that. It's not surprising. Um, a full body, life sized carving of a woman, both front and back on the front and back of a tree, isn't so hard to do. 
Um, so yeah, you know, and even these women are kind of interesting because you can kind of start to make out hairstyles. You can kind of try to hope to place them in a, in a date of what it means to look at a woman. I don't have one here today in the slide. Um, there's a really interesting one of a Virgin Mary in your buckles like holding a baby. And you're like, boy, that naked Virgin Mary, it's kind of an interesting you know, perspective on religion. Um, but boy, her, her hairstyle looks like a 1930s woman, you know, mm -hmm. can look at it that way as a Virgin Mary. So a lot of it is about being, what does it mean to be working away from where you were from? Now, it doesn't mean that you have to even be working on the state. It means you probably left your family back down lower than the mountain. Sometimes that means you went pretty far. Um, one thing that's really powerful and interesting to think about is that a lot of these that were sheep herders, I think they didn't like the sheep. Um, there's <laughs> almost no images of sheep. Now, um, Jose Malate looked at those Basques. They were sheep herders. And he's recorded, he recorded in his lifetime something like 10,000 carvings. Um, a lot of them for the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And in his files, there's like five either references or pictures to sheep. That's it. Um, what do you see? I think it's aspiration. Um, horses. Or down on this one on the left up here that we think that gets repeated over and over in this area. These little like cow skulls or cross type things. Um, the one on the left or your my my right is really interesting because it says Borrego underneath a horse. Yeah, you know, like there you know like if you're a sheep herder, yeah, your sheep is your job. But I'm not sure you really like the sheep. And there's a lot of literature about that that goes back in different ways. Um, who you do like. You might want a horse, but also who you do like is your dog. Um, this this one there with the two dogs smoking a pipe, that's actually from Decoin. And it's one that I went back to El Rito to find and that whole grove was missing from 1968. But, you know, I, I hope he didn't let his dog smoke pipes, but I wouldn't be surprised that lonely sheep herder had conversations with his dogs. <laughs> uh, this one on the right, this one comes from the Savory Stock Drive in the Sierra Madres. And it's another dog picture as well. And that's what you, you see a lot of those animals that aren't sheep and even some exotic ones like snakes, ducks, things like that. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, I've probably recorded a couple thousand myself and not a single drawing of a sheep, not a single, you know, heart with a sheep in it or something like that. Yeah. But that means something. It means about where they're at and what they're doing. And it means about not only what you're doing, but what you want to be and when you're thinking about when you're there. Um, so part of the Minito is a trail of work and it's a trail of travel. And I'm part of this as well. My grandfather left Hernandez outside Espanol in the 1920s and he went up to work in Wyoming um, and he stayed. And so I was born in Wyoming in Laramie. He stayed in Cheyenne throughout his whole life. Um, started on a ranch, this Bull Creek Ranch, later eventually during World War II, helped build airplanes. There was a big United facility, later was a boiler maker and a barber. He had a barber shop in his, um, in his basement until he moved out of his house at 91 years old. Um, and so there's this connection even for me and other people. It's about this travel because you went there because you needed work. Um, and this is a really interesting tourist map of Wyoming. And down in the bottom is, a, well, all through the state, there are these fiery yellow trees. And down in the bottom in that center is this area um, of the Sierra Madres just outside Laramie. Um, encampment pass, battle pass is this area. And Wyoming actually has a scenic byway because the power of those aspen trees. But also in that scenic byway is all those carvings because this is one place you went to work the sheep. Now there's other reasons people went into Wyoming as many of those. Um, they worked in the beet fields. They worked as laborers in town, um, both men and women. Um, they do other, other extractive industries like cutting, cutting trees or even mining coal and things like that. Um, but this is an interesting one that it's, it's something the state recognizes and puts up a scenic byway, but it's also that place you go further. The next one. Um, and when you go there, and there's some pictures around here, you find New Mexico. Um, these are all up in that area, and you find them saying that Arroyo Seco. You find them writing Taos. You find them saying, this is where I'm from, and I'm going to a new place, and I'm claiming it in a way because I know I need to be here but I'm also thinking about how it is and isn't the same as the place I was before. And some of these Minitos stayed and like my grandfather and stayed on and worked. Um, other ones, they wanted to come back to New Mexico. And I mean, my grandfather came back, he went and visited relatives and things like that, but other ones came for different reasons and some, some were annual, some were in different ways as well. And this mark of New Mexico is something that you didn't see written in the trees. It's about, I'm here now in a different place, but I think about that place that I came from. 
And it, it's that process of definition by leaving home sometimes. We see that in a lot of ways of literature and self-discovery that you can never go home again is in some ways because you get defined by those experiences of going away and coming back. Um, here, you see those names that you would see in New Mexico. Um, Eloy Trujillo is all over this area. Um, I don't know who he is or where he came from. He didn't, he never wrote a place under his name. But, you know, there's a lot of Eloy Trujillos in northern New Mexico. And somebody's grandfather was this Eloy Trujillo. And it's not an easy process. Um, one of the things when you talk about Manitos and you think about this process of what does it mean to go to a new place um, and why are they marking the trees is sometimes because they weren't really welcome to be there. They hired you to bring you there, but they didn't necessarily want you to be part of that. And we see this in a whole lot of different ways. Um, one of the ways we see it is how the records that are written sometimes define the people who came from New Mexico. They weren't called New Mexicans. Sometimes in those records, they were called Spanish. Sometimes in those records, they were called Mexicans. There's an interesting telegraph I have that has a definition where they call them old Mexicans versus Mexicans. And it's this interesting, like, ah, there's a whole other system. But one of the things, because of that sort of historical record, got defined in that very racist way was that sometimes it wasn't really seen as people from New Mexico. They were seen as even not Americans, which at this time you were, right? Um, so in 1936, in the middle of the Depression, um, you know, across the Colorado, Wyoming, all New Mexico, it's a hard time. And in 1936, purely as an economic thing, um, Governor Edwin Johnson declared martial law in Colorado and threw a sign up at the border and said, no Mexicans old or new are crossing the border. And this went on for a few months. Um, armed guards at the border, people getting pulled off trains. Um, this one is a Western Union Telegraph, April 28th, 1936. And the bottom is a guy named Kimball, which I think is his National Guard, one of the people from his National Guard. And this is to the governor and it says, 23 turnbacks yesterday, 13 being sheep shearers entering through Durango. And there's a whole pile of these that he was sending in reports and things like we turned away a big group that was supposed to come for $1.25 a day to pick beets in New Mexico, near outside Pueblo. And we turned away these people who were supposed to raise sheep. And this was a purely racist undertaking. And, you know, it, it's something to think about this process of martial law and think about this process of what does it mean to go to this place and work and sometimes get written out of history. Um, and it's a pretty powerful thing. And it takes you back to that idea that in a lot of ways, the trees keep you from getting written out of history because the trees are there with that name where it says Taos written up in Wyoming. And that's a, a thing to think about. What does it mean to write graffiti and why? Do my slide. So you go up there and you see things like this one on my right says Tony Abeta Ledoux. Um, on my left, this one says Jay Mares from Moore, New Mexico. The date's a little hard to read, but it looks like somewhere in September, month nine, 1931. And uh, the other ones, there's a lot of dates that are somewhere from the 30s to the 50s. And it's, you know, you can start thinking about like, yeah, these people were up in Wyoming and they were up there working. What does it mean? Now it's a global world and eventually the amount of sheep in Wyoming died off and there's still sheep herding up there, but today it's run by, well not run by, it's run by locals, but they hire Peruvians on long-term contracts. A few years before that, there were Mexicans coming from Mexico. A few years before that, like into the 1950s, you'll see carvings by Basques and other people from Spain, which not surprising in a post-World War II world, Spain wasn't exactly booming. Um, and so you can think about this as a place and you can think about it as you're in this forest and it is very individual and we can think about ourselves and what it means in that way, but you can't escape these larger implications and they're global. And it's this idea of like, if you're working in the mountains, you're working in a global way sometimes. That's a pretty powerful thing to think about. So up there, Again, though, it goes back to this idea of those were interesting real people. And sometimes they were leaving their names and this one's up in Wyoming and there's no, there's no initials. He just decided to carve a heart. And I say he, but I could be wrong. Um, there actually were a fair number of women who went up there with their men. Occasionally the sheep herders from New Mexico were hired as a family to go up there. Um, but it's this powerful thing. I mean, it means about you're your expressing your humanity on those trees and you're doing what you do. Um, and it's a powerful thing to study. So um, my name is Troy Lovata, and it's kind of a funny misspelling. My grandfather went back and forth between Lovata and Lovato, and that's his own little reasons. Um, this one is up 
again, outside Buckles Lake, right across into Colorado from Chama. And it's a little hard to get on one photo, but it's it's a name, Eucarpio Lobato. And I saw this about, yeah, early last summer. And it's like, man, I don't know of any, any of my relatives named Eucarpio if I go back that far. But there's got to be some cousin of my grandfather bouncing around somewhere who was named Eucarpio. And it's a pretty powerful thing to see yourself written in those trees. Um, I mean, I must admit, my students always ask me, like, have you carved your initials in a tree? And I have to admit, yeah, I did. And I also carved a picture of my dog because we were on hiking. And But yeah, and I, I think we set it up. I did do only my first, oh, I guess I should go back and, and add a, a last name. Um, and it's a powerful thing to think about then when you're inside that forest. And one of the things that's really powerful then to think about um, is that it's understanding that the people who are carving the trees also understood what it meant to carve the trees. Um, if you go to the study of graffiti, you'll see things like people talk about, if I go back to that New York graffiti, what it meant to put the graffiti on the place they lived or they traveled through, those, those subway cars and buildings and things like that. Um, but this is a really interesting one. It's a guy named Benigno, um, Benigno Gallegos, and this is up right near Chama as well, up in the mountains. Um, and his name is all over the place up here. And a few of them are dated. He also drew some beautiful pictures. He drew a beautiful picture of people boxing that from the 1930s. And I'm like, ah, Jack Dempsey was just up the road. It'd be great to, if I could figure out, you know. Um, but this is one of the few where, and I've looked through a lot of different people's files of these Aspen carvings, and he carved the Aspen leaves. He defined himself as the person who wrote his name on trees. And that's a really powerful statement to think about. Um, it, it means he was thinking about what it meant to be there. And it was thinking about, you know, what it meant to occasionally go away. And he's one of these people, he has so many carvings and they're across a few years. We think he came back every summer and, and herded sheep there. And he was returning for different reasons. And the, he may have not stayed in the sense of he doesn't live there or he didn't, um, but his time in that place defined who he was and defined how he thought about himself. And he stamped it with those, I am the carver of trees. So we can think about the Manitos and we can think about uh, other people as well. And when they go into those forests and they tromp up into the mountains, it's about understanding the place and thinking about yourself and defining yourself. And it's a pretty powerful thing to think about. So, you know, the Forest Service, they explicitly would not like you to carve on some trees, um, but it hasn't stopped it. And I think the reason it hasn't stopped it is you can't stop people from thinking about who they are and thinking about where they live and how they got there. So that's all I've got for now. I hope we're gonna do questions at the end after, after Matthew's things, but yeah, I hope to have some engagement after that. So thank you. So please hold your questions to the end. We're happy to also send papers out if you want to write them down so you don't forget your question before we get to the end. Um, but we are going to move on to our next uh, mountain themed uh, presentation with uh, Dr. Matthew Sandoval, who is a senior lecturer in Barrett, the Honors College at Arizona State University. Uh, serendipitously, we pulled two people from Honors Colleges. So I think that's really interesting because it does bring a different type of thinking and engagement with our students at the university. Um, Dr. Sandoval's research concerns a transborder holiday, Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. He teaches courses on cultural studies, performance studies, popular culture, and critical race theory. He's also a performer, storyteller, and documentary filmmaker. And the title for his presentation today is Songs of My Fathers. So I will turn it over to Dr. Sandoval. Well, thank you so much. Um, but <laughs> I love my little lit makeshift name tag and on the spot appreciate it thank you for the suggestion <laughs> for the name tags but before i even tell my stories i just want to um acknowledge that we are here i don't take for granted that we have survived a pandemic and are able to meet in person again um i know the people who organized this exhibition um, don't take for granted that we can meet in person. So it means a lot to just be able to remember this human connection mm -hmm. and to be able to tell stories in person to each other is very meaningful. So um, just a little backstory. <clears throat> I love that um, my family can be a part of this exhibition, the Manito Trail. Um, my family in their wildest dreams, I don't think could ever have imagined that their story would be on museum walls. Um, that's not the kind of people who I come from, but I'm grateful that they're here to see my, my dad's rifle in the gallery is just like, 
it was hard not to cry yesterday at the opening of the exhibition. Um, I met Vanessa here um, a couple years ago in Albuquerque when I was telling stories about my great, great, great grandmother who comes from Northern New Mexico, who was a Navajo slave to a Nuevo Mexicano family, which is also a history of New Mexico that has kind of been buried as well. Uh, and she told me about this project about people who had migrated from Northern New Mexico to elsewhere. And I was like, oh my God, that's my family story. And it was the first time that it registered for me that my family story was part of a web of other families' stories. So I'm just very grateful to be here today. So thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna do my best to project because I know that there is like some outside uh, noises, but I'll do my best. These are the campfire stories of my fathers. By fathers, I mean my pops, my grand pops, my great grand pops, and my uncles who definitely get props because they helped raise me too. My fathers were warriors who weaved their identities into the soil, who knit their spirit to the points where Mother Earth meets Father Sky, which we call mountains. My fathers were mountain Mexicans, redneck brown boys who raised families in tents, in shacks, in motel rooms, in trailers. For generations, my fathers didn't know nothing about no house. From the rusted bluffs of New Mexico to the cold cordilleras of Colorado, to the sagebrush tundra of Eastern Nevada to the tippy tippy top of Montana, my fathers migrated their bodies up and down the bodies of the mountains. My fathers were wild. Wild is the wilderness they called home. Untamed men, outlaw men, restless, always running as if being chased by some ancestral haunting. Somewhere deep in my father's lineage, they, there had been a break, a rupture, a trauma creating a void in each of these boys that could never be filled even as they became men. These are the stories of my fathers. My fathers were campfire storytellers. They passed on our family history one tall tale at a time. Half fact, half fiction, but always enchanting mythology. Stories of mischief, adventure, and always some tragedy. We gather deep in the mountains, underneath the stars, sit around a large open flame and listen as Sandoval genealogy was passed on and ancestral food was passed around. Tortillas, bonelos, pinion pine nuts, potatoes, deer meat. My fathers carved their names in aspen trees because when you can't afford art supplies, tree bark becomes your canvas. My fathers carved their names in aspen trees because when you don't own land, you need some way to mark your existence. My fathers carved their names in aspen trees for generations, an ancestral art form that dates back to at least my great grandpa Lucas who taught his sons to cut carve, chop, slice, and stab. Lucas was masterful with blades. He was a lumberjack from the woodlands of Penasco here in Taos County. At five feet, two inches, my great grandpa Lucas was a slight man, but he was strong as the granite mountains that made him. Lucas was a hard worker, a lifelong worker, sun up to sun down worker. 12 hours a day, every day, he chopped down pine trees, hauled enormous logs to the mill on the edge of town 
where he'd then use a broad ax to trim that timber, chopping with precision to fashion trees into railroad ties, train tracks to transport goods and people. As a railroad lumberjack, Lucas spent his life doing the toilsome, invisible work to connect his mountain village to the world outside Taos County, to the world outside New Mexico, to the world that he would never know, a world that he would never see, see. He died deep in the forest, ax in hand, a lumberer laboring to the bitter end. His body gave out on a mountain slope in a grove of aspens whose bark had been carved with memories, whose leaves shook like tambourines, sweet New Mexico melodies lullabied Lucas to sleep. My fathers carved their names in aspen trees, arbor glyphs turned epitaphs, aspen leaves turned graveyard flowers. A restless soul sown into the mountain soil. These are the stories of my fathers. My fathers carved their names in aspen trees with hunting knives. Buck brand blades with carved bone handles. Steel stained purple with dried blood from stabbing into the bellies of beasts. For generations, my father stabbed into the bellies of beasts that they'd stalk through trees, through snow, through brush. Their footsteps like whispers on the wind as they creep in for the kill. My father stabbed into the bellies of beasts that they'd taken down with a bow or a bullet. They'd stab that animal gut that animal, empty that animal, because they had to drag that animal for miles through the mountains. My father stabbed into the bellies of beasts in order to fill the bellies of kids and wives just trying to survive in those mountain winters, where our survival was tied to my father's acumen with animal tracks and accuracy with rifle scopes. So my father stabbed into the bellies of beasts, all beasts, mule deer, mountain lions, antelope, in good years, elk, in poor rur years, jackrabbit. <laughs> Jackrabbits were mountain Mexican training. That's how I started. Pops gave me his 22 rifle. I saw that jackrabbit. I sighted that jackrabbit. That's a dead ass jackrabbit. <laughs> that was 1987. I was eight years old. My father stabbed into the bellies of beasts, all beasts, men too. It's likely that for Sandoval's, this dates back at least to my great grandpa Lucas once again. After all, the only picture we have of him is his jail photo from Santa Fe County Laca. When it comes to blades, great grandpa Lucas and his son, my great grandpa, my grandpa Jose, were cut from the same cloth. For my father's knife lessons were life lessons, skills they needed to survive in those mountains, skills they needed to survive those mountain towns where they weren't always welcome. So sometimes my fathers had to stab into the bellies of beasts in work camps, in saloons, or casinos in Eastern Nevada mining colonies, which is where my grandpa's Jose stabbed that cowboy. See, cowboy picked a fight at the blackjack table with Jose's nephew. And that's one thing you don't do because we defend our kin, we protect our clan, 
That's code of ethics for a mountain Mexican man, rule number uno, in fact. The cowboy messed around and found out, found out that Jose was quick to the knife, quick and hard. A couple inches north of cowboy's belt buckle is where Jose buried his buck brand blade all the way to the carved bone handle. But he didn't give the cowboy the full fillet like summertime alpine lake trout. He cleanly pulled the blade out so that cowboy wouldn't bleed out, just black out at the blackjack table where he fell at the feet of Jose and his nephew who were now safe from harm. Jose went to jail, of course, but it would have been a fool's errand to find remorse in Grand Pops who didn't hesitate to plead guilty even though he couldn't read the charges or speak the language of the law. It didn't matter because he knew Mountain Mexican Code of Ethics by heart. Family over everything. Family over everything. My father stabbed into the bellies of beasts, all beasts, men too, in work camps, saloons, casinos, or gas station parking lots in Eastern Nevada mining colonies, which is where my uncle Orly stabbed that pig. And by pig, I mean cop. And by cop, I mean sheriff. A sheriff who didn't understand Orly's Spanish, a sheriff who didn't like Orly's look, a sheriff who got too close to Orly, not knowing that Orly was unstable from Korea. Orlando Fortunado Gallegos, Uncle Orly for short, drafted as a backwoods boy who couldn't really speak English, didn't really graduate high school, but he could hunt. So the US Army gave him the scent of Korean kami and then sent him to kill Korean kami. So he went and killed Korean commies. And when he came back, all he had were these, what my father's called problems. Orly lived a year of his life with war close, bullets close, death close. So Orly didn't like when people got close. If you got close, Orly would defend himself. Korean commie, mountain sheriff, all the same. Orly was trained to defend himself. He kept a knife at his waist just in case you got too close, which is what this sheriff did. So Orly unsheathed his steel to stab into the belly of the beast. But that sheriff unsheathed his steel and shot until there were no rounds left, until there was no Uncle Orly left. Just a gas station parking lot pooled with blood and snow and dead aspen leaves. That was 1987. I was eight years old. In my mountain school classroom, I had to sit next to the sheriff's son. Day after day, grade after grade, I had to sit next to the sheriff's son, learning how to read, learning how to write, praying to Mother Earth and Father Sky that someday I might bring Orly, Jose, and Lucas back to life, bring all my fathers back to life through the campfire poetry of mountain Mexicans. These are the stories of my fathers. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how y'all are feeling right now, but um, I, I'm really thankful for bringing both Troy and Matthew together today. 
I did not imagine when I invited them both how serendipitously <laughs> their talks would, would flow together. And so um, thank you, Troy. Thank you, Matthew. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know both of you. And it's been a pleasure to be here moderating this uh, panel. So I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Karen, yes, I'll go to you. you. I would like to just share a comment from the chat. Um, Christina, Matt sends love from McGill. Oh, okay. my crew is on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Mountain Mexicans know how to use Zoom, y'all. I love it. We're out here. Send my love back. My love, you my just, love yes. back. There it is. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for coming in. All right. Um, so questions. I'd love to start with questions. And go ahead and raise your hand. If you're on Zoom, feel free to place your question in the chat. Hey, Sam. Can I hug him? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yes. yes. Can okay. Can that happen? <laughs> it's part of that being back in person after oh, yes. a couple of oh years. Oh my gosh. Too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Amazing. <laughs> that was worth the drive from Phoenix, Wonderful. by the way. Oh, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yes, please. I have a question uh, for the first speaker, yeah. Dr. Lorenzo. Yeah. Um, on the carvings on the trees, uh, besides the ones that have actual dates, how are you able to know the dates of those other carvings that didn't have dates? How could you? Yeah, so we can't. I mean, in the sense of that, if you, you, you can't, you know, radiocarbon a carving, um, in a sense, it becomes this process of kind of relativity. Um, right. There are some times when you'll see a carving with a date that actually kind of goes over another carving and you know which one is first. So you can get that, you know, you can space them out in that I way. I was wondering yeah. if any were recent carvings. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of recent carvings. And so it's, I, there was that. Well, the, the way you can, a little bit of what you can tell is, like I said, the carving starts, in it. you can start really small with the carving, you can start really big, deep, but it doesn't have to be deep. And the, the you know, the tree itself is living. And what happens is two things. The tree grows, but it grows out. And so the carving actually changes shape over time and the tree tries to make a scar. And some of those really dark black ones are really old because the tree tries to grow, you know, and it happens if you cut your finger, got a couple um, on a knife, um, you know, that scar tissue. Um, you even see some things here. I didn't have a photo of one of them, not as many, but over time when that tree grows wider and bigger, the scar actually grows and you get a double image. Um, there's, uh, Jose Malata has one in, that in his book that's this beautiful picture of a woman that looks like two inches next to each other. And to realize that it, we don't know the rates because trees grow in different ways in different places, how you know, much moisture, where they're at. But you're looking at something that could take decades to do that. Um, there's the one I showed of a handprint and it still doesn't look black. And some of them, I mean, they look green and you're like, that was this year. It didn't turn brown yet, much less black. Also, my second question, in your research and these carvings, these messages, mm -hmm. did you find any um, uh, similar message for follow travelers like they have found in the Underground Railroad? You know, I'm not so sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, some and of those would things. Say they would actually be directions on where to go or there would be a safe house. Did you find any patterns of uh, messages being given to? Yeah, I mean, not so much safe house, but, you know, I mean, that one about don't with those two arrows and one is scratched out. And if you hike that ridge up into San Pedro Parks, you want to go drop into that beautiful little valley and you're not going to get up to the flat water at the top. And yeah, so you see a lot of that. Um, we see a lot of things where you just see an arrow in a tree and the message is a little bit lost, mm -hmm. but somebody put an arrow to tell somebody else or themselves later, you know, make sure you turn left. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's a, it's a powerful thing to think about when we found some of these, some students and I like, uh, you know, we found a couple that say water with an arrow, you start walking in circles and see if you can find the spring. Um, and if you can find the spring, you're like, okay, and where does that arrow point? And did it really take me? <laughs> Um, so there's a little bit of that, yeah. Um, I mean, the vast majority of the carvings really are, boy, there's some initials, and I don't know who the initials are, you know, but okay. that means something as well, yeah. yeah. I just have another question for Dr. Uh, Sandoval. Yeah. Um, are you, do you have a book of stories that she's <gasps> written? <laughs> Yo, do you got a publisher for me? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, to no, be you're such a masterful storyteller. I'm wondering if you've written uh, a sequence of stories. I, I've been working on that for several years now. And to be honest, it, it really started uh, 
not even because I was interested in the Manito aspect, although that's a part of it. It's like I said, I started researching my genealogy and was really interested in my grandmother who was Navajo, but owned um, by Nuevo Mexicanos. And that made me rethink my entire lineage uh, and wanting to know more so that I could tell more. But I feel like I'm a I'm a storyteller because my fathers were storytellers, mm -hmm. you know, that it really like all of this comes from knowing how to know how to tell a story around a campfire. My fathers were very good at that. Very good. Yeah. And we'll go to Zoom for the next question. Just a, it's just a couple of con comments about uh, family that that's here. So Aunt Jo is here. Yeah. Yo, <laughs> <laughs> these stories would not happen without Aunt Jo. Aunt Jo is here with the crew. Oh, and, um, Uncle Rick and Aunt Tamara are watching from Eli, Nevada. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So I got my whole family here. This is amazing. <laughs> All the manitos in the house. <laughs> And uh, well, the next question is coming up. I wanted to share that here in the back are some of the photos that um, our previous producer for the Following the Manito Trail project, his name is Adam Herrera, not a Manito, surprisingly, um, but very interested uh, in documenting. And so Troy and I and Adam actually went to the Sierra Madres to do this documentation project in 2016. And um, in, again, a string of serendipitous encounters, we said, hey, it'd be really cool to see sheep on this trip. And we're driving through the mountain and there's a herd of sheep or a flock of sheep can't coming across the road. The road. Yeah. We can't cross the road. That photo is right here. <laughs> and we uh, we stopped to talk to the, a Peruvian sheep herder. And what was interesting about it is that uh, Peruvians are also very uh, famed sheep herders, just as normal Mexicanos were back in the day and continue to be. But as we continued to speak with him, he talked about how difficult it was to even be able to come to the United States to be a sheep herder. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because there are folks who will show up to the airport in Peru and they'll engage in a 30 minute interview. And depending on how precise your answers are, you pass a test to be able to come to the United States to be a sheep herder. Mm -hmm. Now they're also part of this American dream, right? They tell their families back at home. And again, this is about the stories we tell. They go back home and they say, life is good for me in the United States. And they write letters and they call home. But they're very lonely as sheep herders, right? For the reasons that you can all imagine. Um, normally they go out and herd on their own. Um, he had funny stories about the sheep themselves, you know? Yeah. So I don't think he cared for his sheep either. But he would talk <laughs> about the sheep that wears the bell would go this way. So half the flock would go that way. The others would be headed that way. And so it was a really big kind of struggle for him to be able to do that. But one of the other questions we asked was about the sheep camps, because in my mind, the sheep camps were isolated. They didn't have technology. And so we continued on our path and we met another sheep herder from Peru. And he said, I talk to my wife on the phone every night. I have a generator in my yeah, sheep camp, too. solar yeah, panels. Yeah, yeah. And so the technology has changed as such that's not as isolating, although physically it's isolated because they're there by themselves, but they're connected globally through these technologies. So, mm -hmm. and so you had a question. Oh, first of all, where's the photo taken from the one that you're discussing? This one was in the Sierra Madres. Yeah, so, so Southern you keep Wyoming. calling them the Sierra Madres, but I'm from Southern Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, is so it you, the medicine bows or is it like? You keep going past that? the medicine bows, past okay. camp, like near encampment. Uh -huh. And it's the it's, my hood. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Excellent. I don't so, Madre sign. No, but that's so. yeah, that's what they're called as the mountains. I mean that that road that goes toward bags is oh, yeah. that's the road. Out there. Yeah, so, exactly. And that's right. you know, and yeah. like I said, you know, it's not I mean, today there's still sheep herders there, but I mean the numbers aren't as big. But people are still going there and they're they're hunting. You know, um one of these dates that I I think I put up there was September, and that's pretty late to be up with your sheep. Yeah. It's not very late at the end of September to be going to hunt. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you start, and that's something I we were trying to look at, you know, it's like, saying, yeah, what's it mean? And, you know, when you find I, there was one up near Buckles Lake that was in December 1957. And you're like, mm -hmm. there's no sheep in December. It's yeah. also really hard to get up there. It is snowed in. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, you didn't just stumble up there. You went hunting. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's that that sort of battlement pass area. Yeah, from yeah, and it's not just like a, I think what you're talking about is like it's not just a historical narrative. There's futurism that is mixed in what you're saying because yeah. like we were hunting out there with my dad and he got covered in an avalanche and we just left him because he's my dad. And <laughs> <laughs> better things to do. Yeah. And, uh, and then there was a Mexican guy that thought he was going to die. Like, well, we might, but what are we going to do? You know. 
it's an avalanche. And then three days later, he found a bar 50 miles away in Centennial. He said, I'm sure you wouldn't die. You had a bottle with me. <laughs> you know? And uh, like the Sandoval's, we, they were our sworn bitter enemies in Laramie, Wyoming. Yeah. Yeah. They're bandits. They have. They carry knives. See? Well, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. We yeah. are. Exactly. <laughs> so it's all encoded in there. I thought I'd be the only one from Laramie, yeah. the northernmost New Mexican adobe, and um, all kinds of things that the the uh, colonizers are now trying to destroy. Yeah, and it they don't is. Yeah. The value of it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things for me that it's, it, you know, I mean, yes, these trees are going to go away, like everything. I mean, we've yeah. collected some, we, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, the, the stories when they don't get told, you know, people want them to go away and that helps it. If you go out and look at that tree and you see the name and you see the place, you're like, yeah, yeah that doesn't the go. stories are just backward because that's the record, but the record is like, which said, was it pointing to? Yeah. And it's and, also pointing to the future. Yeah, exactly. And it's so, funny, you know, as an archaeologist with my training, um, up there, you know, the way a lot of archaeology works today is, you know, the, the federal government contracts out to somebody to do something. They're gonna build a road or a power plant or a coal mine or, you know. And um, a lot of the archeologists, you know, were actually recording some of these trees all the way back to the 1980s. But what happened is a lot of that literature gets kind of a gray literature of lost in a folder in the back of a forest service office and nobody really gets to read it. And it was really funny because the, the, state, the state historical preservation office of Wyoming had all these guides to like the history of Wyoming and they put them all online and there's nothing about Manitas. Yeah. at all what's well, a new term to me actually yeah because, and, because i'm from laramie i'm like i don't yeah. know what you guys are talking about we came here from the <laughs> yeah and that, that's the thing yeah and but the thing was that same those same shippo office hired all the archaeologists who were like these are all coming from new mexico you know and it, they've done better now they actually have updated their website to say like oh yeah, you know, some of those histories were written by people who did things like they looked at census documents. And in those census documents, sometimes those New Mexicans weren't called Americans. And I mean, when I showed that martial law, 1936, that was one US state against another. That was not an international border, but it was thought of as one. And so it's a pretty powerful thing to kind of think about, like, yeah, who gets recorded and why. And, and when we were hunting up there, we used to take off of the Aspens because if you have a headache, if you're yeah. dehydrated, mm. the underneath the bark is where the aspirin. Is. Yeah, it's that similar alkaloid. Yeah, yeah. And, it, I mean, and so there's yeah. marks from that. To yeah. The medicinal elements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's also marks from the elk eating the aspirin because when the yeah. snow's deep, you'll yeah. see these scratches. And we're all, first you go up there and you look at it like, what are these weird scratches on the trees? Who was trying to carve that? And then you'll see some new ones and you're like, yeah, they were. It was a it was a winter day and they were trying to get a little greener. Yeah. No, and that aspen thing is the same. It's a it helps your headache and you're up at high elevation. You know, it thins your blood a little bit. You, you know, we go tell people to take some aspirin, chew on an aspirin. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah. Thanks for coming. I mean, yeah. this is, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, I'm literally on my way to Wyoming. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that just happened to be going through. <laughs> That's the That's time to stop. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's still happening. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And my great grandmother was born not far away. Yeah. And I, you know, I, Less it, than a mile it's funny. I came back to New Mexico as a faculty member. You know, because I, I got a lot of relatives in Colorado and I ended up in high school in Wisconsin and I went to Colorado for school in Texas. And, you know, a lot of this becomes, I mean, for me, I was looking at all these trees and as a scholar and I, I, some other projects were looking at trails and maps and things. I knew they were there from when I was a kid. I knew people carved their names. And then it was like, wait a second, <laughs> there's a meaning behind it. And yeah, it is graffiti, but it, that's why it's powerful. Graffiti is about recording the story sometimes that well, you don't have this bag place. here. I don't know if you know this man, John Michel Basquiat. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. most valuable American painter in the world. <laughs> yeah, as a graffiti yeah. artist. As a graffiti yeah. artist, right? Yeah, He's Puerto Rican and, and native and Haitian. You know? Yeah, and and also yeah. American too. Yeah, and American. I have a friend who's you know moved to New Mexico and went to high school in Brooklyn with him. Yeah. Um. And and he said, yeah, it's about defining yourself in that place now because you. You know, because he came to New York doesn't mean that he gives up meaning that he's Haitian okay. and that he's, you know, those things all operate. It's, it's a funny thing to think about. My grandfather, you know, he, it's funny, he was the oldest, I mean, I think he still had, he had the record for serving, the, or being a member of the Eagles Club oh, in Wyoming. 60 years he was a member when he died. And I have his pin and it, you were like family over everything. And the, <laughs> on the pin, it is FOE, Fraternal Order of Eagles. Hmm. I mean, there's. And that's this overlap, you know, but he, he would come back and, you know, he wanted to go visit his cousins back in Hernandez or when they moved to Superior in Arizona. 
And, but he's also somebody who made his whole life there in Wyoming after 1926. And he married one of my grandmothers. Um, she was from Mora and she, her family had immigrated from Pennsylvania to cut wood. And then, you know, it ended up in Wyoming. And it's this, but you don't forget about where you're from even when you're in that new place. You know, my wife's from Cleveland. Yeah, she doesn't forget about that, but she's pretty happy to be here. <laughs> you know? um, but but, but you, you, if you're part of that, even if you're not there, it's the story, you know, like almost all my relatives have moved out of Wyoming because then there's better jobs in Colorado. Right. <laughs> but it doesn't mean they forgot about their place more. We're going to send it back to Karen. You have a comment and a question. A comment. I'm going to try to say this without without crying. <laughs> Matt, your mom says thank you for honoring your father's past and enlarging the Sandoval Fab history. For those present and future, you are a treasure to us. Love you, mom. Oh, <laughs> 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 We're going to go to Ms. Trampilina Pacheco. If you don't know her, who's your grandma? Some of your also. But um, uh, my grandma, who was born here, was uh, Sadie Martinez. And then Somos Achuletas from, from, from here. Yeah, and, uh, and Igual de Cerro. Cerca de, uh, de Cuesta. Yeah, so and, um, and Romero. Oh, that. Oh, the couple. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so, what part of Wyoming are you going to go? Uh, Laramie. Yeah, I'm going to go see my Laramie. grandma. Laramie. Yeah. How, how old are you, ma'am? I have 87. So, my grandmother just turned 87, January yeah, 1st. Right, yeah. And she's the last who knows the old stories of when she came that way. She's the oldest of our whole clan. There's 33 families that came from this area, and she's the last of the elders. So, just like you. And, you know. First, when we got married, uh -huh. I was barely 17 years old. We, we moved to Wyoming. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Where at? And I know Laramie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you probably know each other. Yeah, Ellie Fonsa is my grandma. Rock Springs, yeah. Lawrence, all that. Oh, yeah. Ellie Fonsa, Archuleta. She, she's from her. We're check was. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> There's a video at the end I'm of the room here that's about her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to turn the Zoom screen because people, right. I'm sure, will yes. we're very honored to have Ms. Tankirina Pacheco here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Romero just mentioned that in this family room, you'll find us a, uh, a story. I mean, she's here in person, but there's a video of her family story in the next room if you have time to check it out. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Jerry. Um, I, I think in the introduction for Dr. Samuel, um, there was mention of the transnational portion to your work. Oh, uh, did did I mishear that, or did, I was just kind of curious if there is. Oh, I would enjoy hearing <laughs> what aspects. Of the yeah, work with I think I think the transnational uh, stuff was with regards to Dia de los Muertos, uh -huh. uh, which is, I mean, that's what I do as a scholar. I study uh, Day of the Dead. As a, as a ritual, as a ceremony that has changed over the last several hundred years, uh, and even over the last 10 years, really. So a study, I think of that in terms of transnationalism, because of course, Dia de los Muertos exists in Mexico, in Latin America, but it exists in the Southwest in general. Uh, and the way that it lives in Mexico and appears in Mexico is different than how it appears in Albuquerque or Santa Fe or Los Angeles. Um, but they're all connected in some sense through migration routes in and out of Mexico, but also because of um, media, magazines, literature, film, et cetera. So I study Day of the Dead as a transnational cultural phenomenon to get really geeky uh, as, a, as a scholar that way. Um, so yeah, that's the transnational aspect of it. Um, but it, it's because of my research on Day of the Dead also that got me really interested and invested in knowing my ancestors uh, because Day of the Dead is the day with which you honor your ancestors. And I make altars for my ancestors. You know, I'll put the pictures up on the ofrenda and stuff like that. Um, but at a certain point, I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to know and see if I could really bring to life <laughs> those people uh, who have come before me. Thank you. Yeah. 
And if you all are interested, so there's one of the, the very last at the bottom right corner is Anselmo Arellanos que pasa descanse. Uh, Los Pobladores Nuevo Mexicanos y Su Poesía. And it's a really great resource for anyone who's interested in how Manito Sheep Herders narrated in poetry form, in corrido form, their journeys to, to Wyoming, to Colorado, to Nevada. And so the book is in the case, but you can pull off that the wall, that pamphlet or that flyer and kind of look through it and see how they were writing about their stories because they carry these stories with them and they were often published in Spanish language newspapers and then uh, Co uh, brought together by Anselmo Ariano in the 1970s. Right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so yeah. we'll wrap it up. Um, did you want to say something? No, I, okay. I want to thank everybody for coming, <laughs> and I want to thank every you know you for putting this together, Vanessa. I mean, without you and your work, it doesn't happen, and that's the beautiful part. I mean, you you said you didn't quite know how Matt and I were going to overlap. <laughs> I had, a, I had an inkling and I'm okay. glad it overlapped so well because the stories themselves, they can be individual, but they're also, they get bigger and when they overlap because they're stories, because they're lived life. That's the really powerful thing. 100, there's no way to tell the story of Manitos without telling yeah. the story of Aspen trees. And now we can't tell it without you driving by, <laughs> you know, yeah. and heading exactly. back up to Laramie. So um, yeah. that's how it works. And it's supposed to work that way. Yes. Thank you to the three of you for yeah. such a wonderful <laughs> Um, just as a way to close out, we do have the, the feedback form here. We would love to hear your feedback on this. We also have a little table right there. I'm looking at you to put your name on that <laughs> paper right there. If you have a migration story to share, we would love to contact you. We conduct oral histories quite often. That's how this exhibit comes to be. Uh, we did do an exhibit at the uh, American Heritage Center in 2017 in Laramie. I don't know if you were there. But it was, was on, on uh, okay, ah, okay, you missed, you missed it. it. Yeah. But it was uh, families who were mostly from Las Vegas and Mora who went up to Wyoming. This one specifically focuses on families from Taos County. I'll do one in the near future on families from Western New Mexico and Eastern Arizona. So we have a lot in the works. Um, this project continues. We just met Mr. Jerry Cisneros who's doing Manito stories in California. So the project grows right. all the time. Uh, we love to hear your stories if you'd love to share them. So thank you all again uh, to the New Mexico Humanities Council. Thank you for uh, supporting this. And thank you, buddy, your mom. <laughs> yeah, say bye, mom. <laughs> I'll FaceTime you all soon. I love you so much. Bye, Matthew's mom. <laughs> thank you all. Okay, thank you. Okay.